Scripture reading today is from Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, that's on page 1040 in the Pew Bible. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain. And he seized the dragon, that ancient serpent who is the devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years, and threw him into the pit, and shut it, and sealed it over him, so that he might not deceive the nations any longer, until the thousand years were ended. After that he must be released for a little while. Then I saw thrones, and seated on them were those to, were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus, and for the word of God, and who had not worshipped the beast or its image, and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. This is the first resurrection. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power. But they will be priests of God and of Christ, and they will reign with him for a thousand years. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. From his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne. And books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. Well, when I started preaching on Revelation, of course, many people were most interested in this passage. But I'd never preached on Revelation because of this passage. And it's going to be a different kind of sermon because we do have to explain what's in this text, and it's a very controversial text. So, the premillennial view. that The premillennial view means before the millennium, before the thousand years. Christ will come before the millennium. The, the thousand years doesn't have to be a literal number in the premillennial view. It could just be a, a symbolic long period of time. That really doesn't matter to that view. Many think it is a literal number, but it doesn't have to be. It's just that Christ comes before this golden age on earth of a thousand years. Revelation 19, the second coming of Christ, precedes the millennium, the thousand years in which there is peace and joy on earth. So, Why do I lean towards the premillennial view? There's so many things we can say here. I am just looking at this text. Let let me just say something about how I prepared for this. I read a lot of things again. I've read about this a lot during my life. I read a lot of things again, and I just said, what is the most natural meaning of this passage? That's all I wanted to do. What, What do I think this passage says? most naturally. And here's what I came up with. Here's my first reason why I lean towards the premillennial view. First, the chaining and the binding of Satan doesn't fit with the millennium being now, but it fits better 
with the millennium taking place in the future after Christ has come. So that, that's a long statement, isn't it? But I'm going to explain it. In other words, what we see in the first three verses of Revelation is a future event when Satan will not deceive the nations. Let's think a little bit about other parts of the Bible. 1 John 5.19 says, The whole world lies in the power of the evil one. John says three times in his gospel that Satan is the ruler of this world. In Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, Paul says that Satan is the prince of the power of the air. In 2 Corinthians 4, 4, he says about Satan that he is the god of this world. What Revelation describes, however, is the total restriction of Satan during the thousand years. Let's look at the verses. Verse 1. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, holding in his hand the key to the bottomless pit. By the way, many translations translate that as the abyss. It's under the earth, okay? The bottomless pit is under the earth. That's really important. He held the key to that bottomless pit, that abyss, and a great chain. And he sees the dragon, the monster. Satan's a monster, isn't he? He's that ancient serpent. He's that ancient serpent of Genesis chapter 3. He's a liar. He lies about the things of God. He's a deceiver. Who is the devil? He's a slanderer. He slanders God's people, and he slanders God's name too. And he's Satan. He's God's adversary. And he's our adversary as saints. There's no doubt about who this person is. And he bound him for a thousand years. And where did he go? And he threw him into the pit. So that same word, he threw him into that abyss. And he shut it. And he sealed it. And he locked it. So he couldn't get out. I take it. So that he might not deceive the nations any longer until the thousand years were ended. After that, he must be released for a little while. Note the completeness of the limitation here. I think, I, I think that's hard to fit with the verses I just referred to, that he's the God of this world, that the whole world lies in his power. I think this refers to a different period of time, to the future after Christ comes when Satan is bound for a thousand years or a long period of time. But here was a, real, here, here was a decisive point for me. You consider this. When I compare Revelation 12 to Revelation 20, Revelation 12, which we looked at some time ago, In Revelation 12, Satan is thrown to the earth. When was Satan cast out of heaven and thrown to the earth in Revelation 12? I mean, I preached on that a long time ago. I argued then, and I still believe, it happened at the cross of Christ, that Satan was cast to the earth. And and, and and when he was cast to the earth, he has a short time. I argued then that that refers to this whole period from the first to the second coming. That's a short time. And what does he do when he's cast to the earth? He persecutes God's saints. Well, let's look at Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. Just one verse there. And the great dragon was thrown down. Same word that we've seen in Revelation. He's a monster. That ancient serpent. Yeah, from Genesis 3 again. Who is called the devil and Satan. Actually, all four descriptions are repeated, aren't they, from Revelation 20. The deceiver of the whole world. He was thrown down to the earth, and his angels were thrown down with him. In Revelation 12, Satan is thrown down to the earth, and when he comes to the earth, he wars on the saints and persecutes God's people. But in Revelation 20, he is locked up in the abyss, and he is not allowed to afflict God's people. So that's decisive for me. 
You, you think about that and make up your own mind. I, I find it very hard to believe that the earth, being thrown to the earth and being cast into the abyss are the same thing. You see? It seems to me they're two different things, two different descriptions of what's going to happen. Or, well, one is what has happened at the cross. And the second is what will happen in the future. When he's thrown to the earth, he has a short time till the second coming to persecute believers and deceive the nations. His being thrown to the earth fits with his being the God of this world and the whole world lying in his power. But in the future, he will be thrown into the underworld, not the earth, and he is restricted from doing any damage. So that's my first argument. First reason. Second reason. So the first reason is the total limitation of Satan during the millennium, the thousand years. The second reason, the coming to life and the resurrection in verses 4 through 6 is most likely physical. Let's read verses 4 through 6, and I'll comment on them as I go. Then I saw thrones. And seated on them were those to whom the authority to judge was committed. Take that to be believers. Also I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God. The martyrs. Those who had stood for Christ. And who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. And I'm not going to linger on this, but I think that includes all believers there. No believer worships the beast. No believer gives his allegiance or her allegiance to the, to the beast. So I think all believers are included here. And, and authority is given to them to judge, which I take to mean to rule. You know, Adam was meant, human beings, we were meant to rule the world for God. Adam forfeited that, didn't he, through his sin. That, that's our destiny, isn't it? And I, I think that's what this passage is talking about. They came to life, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. What does it mean that they came to life, and they reigned with Christ a thousand years? I, I want to think of another passage again, and I'm not going to turn there, but think of Revelation chapter 6. There we see martyrs under the altar as well. You can look at it later if you don't remember this passage. And there they're saying, How long, O Lord, until you'll vindicate us and avenge our blood? And and the Lord says, Wait, wait. But here, it doesn't say wait. It says they came to life. And they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. I think that's another argument for it being a future millennial reign, you see? Wait in chapter 6 during this present age, but here it's not wait, but they came to life. Well, there's more to be said. The rest of the dead did not come to life until the thousand years were ended. I take that to refer to unbelievers. This is the first resurrection. Now, this is a little bit confusing here, but this is the first resurrection is referring back to verse 4. Right? Because the rest of the dead, that's clearly a second event. So this is the first resurrection refers to they came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So here's the decisive question. What does John mean by the word Resurrection. Everywhere else in Scripture, the word resurrection refers to a physical resurrection. I want to mention a book here by N.T. Wright. It's a a long book, but it's a great book called The Resurrection of the Son of God. He is not a premillennialist, but he does a thorough study of this word resurrection. And he argues in this book that the word resurrection always refers to a physical resurrection. Always. Except for he kind of pulls back when he comes to this passage. But you see, that's the only one. I think it's much more likely that this word means what it means everywhere else. A physical resurrection. 
if it's a physical resurrection, then the millennium must be in the future. Right? Because that hasn't happened yet, right? Our physical resurrection hasn't happened yet. Then it has to be a future event. Verse 6. Blessed and holy is the one who shares in the first resurrection. Whatever your view, this is the crucial part, isn't it? Blessed and holy is the one who belongs to this first resurrection. The second, that second, the rest of the dead. You don't want to be in that category. But how blessed you are if you're part of the first resurrection because over this one, the second death has no power. And what is the second death? It's the lake of fire. It's hell. But they will be priests of God and Christ. And they will reign with them for a thousand years. They will be priests. They'll have access to God. And they'll reign with Christ. That reign is the reign that Adam was intended to exercise. But that reign now belongs to who? To Jesus Christ. Why would there be a millennium on earth? For a thousand years or for a long period of time. Because it would fulfill the promise that Jesus would reign on earth as the Davidic king. That the reign of human beings would be actualized in history. The reigns of David and Solomon anticipated Jesus' rule and will reign with him. It will be a golden age. It will be sort of like life in the Shire in the Lord of the Rings. Right? It'll be like that. It will be like Camelot. We, we, we sing and, and write about this sort of thing, don't we? About a golden age that's coming. And it will happen in this world, I take it. Jesus will reign and will reign with him and will be raised from the dead. Third, the third reason. Verse 10, and I can go a little faster here. Verse 10 most naturally reads as if the devil is thrown into the place where the beast and the false prophet already were. So let's read verses 7 through 10. It reads as if The devil is thrown into the lake of fire and the beast and the false prophet are already there. And when the thousand years are ended, Satan will be released from his prison and will come out to deceive the nations that are at the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them for battle. Their number is like the sand of the sea. This is after the millennium then, after the thousand years. And they marched up over the broad plain of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. But fire came down from heaven and consumed them. By the way, if we read in Ezekiel chapter 38 and 39, we see the prophecy of these passages. Ezekiel chapter 38 verse 22 says, And with pestilence and with blood I shall enter into judgment with him, and I shall rain on him and on his troops and on the many peoples who are with him, a torrential rain with hailstones, fire, and brimstone. And Ezekiel 39.6, And I shall send fire upon Magog and those who inhabit the coastlands in safety, and they will know that I am the Lord. Why does God release Satan after a thousand years? Well, I, I don't know specifically, but, but I think one of the reasons that has been given is quite possible. It shows the power of human sin. If people rebel against God after living in a golden age, a perfect environment, virtually, it shows that human sin isn't due to the environment. It shows that human sin is deeply rooted in our hearts. You know, there's a lot of people in our culture who believe The children are naturally good. If we could just let them flower and express themselves, they'd they'd grow up to be wonderful, but they're tainted by the environment and us. And and there's some truth in that, aren't they? Well, because we're sinners. 
But, but there's a fundamental mistake in it as well, and that is the Scriptures teach sin is deeply rooted in all of us. All of us who are perceptive and who have raised children, we know that about our children. I mean, because we know it about ourselves, don't we? So perhaps one reason for allowing Satan to be released at the end is to show the power of sin. Well, verse 10, And the devil who had deceived them was thrown into the lake of fire and sulfur, where the beast and the false prophet were. Most likely, most naturally, we would read that to say they were already there. And this is a new stage from chapter 19. At the end of chapter 19, at the second coming, the beast and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire, and now Satan is thrown there. And they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Now, so if I've lost you during this sermon, and, you, and you've been saying, I, I don't care about this stuff, now come back to me, okay? Come back to me for, for the last point. Here's my last question from verse 10 and verses 11 through 15. Who will escape the lake of fire and the second death? That's the most important question, isn't it? Who will escape? Verse 11. Because the judgment's coming. Then I saw a great white throne and him who was seated on it. Revelation 21.1, next chapter we're going to look at. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. So verse 11 of chapter 20 is speaking of the end of the present world order before the new heavens and the new earth are inaugurated. And what happens at this great white throne? Verse 12, And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they had done, according to their works. So we have a judgment scene. And everybody's included in this judgment scene. Is everybody included? Look at verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done, according to their works. So this is the most important court scene in all of history. The Son of Man sits on the throne and books are opened and people are judged. All people are judged according to what they've done. Then death and Hades, verse 14, were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. It's the final judgment, the lake of fire. That's where Satan will be. That's where the beast and the false prophet will be. And that's where all of those will be who do not belong to Christ. If anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. So that's that's the most decisive, important issue in this passage. Are you in the book of life? Why doesn't this passage say that those who believe, those who trust Christ, will be written in the book of life? Why doesn't it talk about faith? Why does it talk about works? You see? Well, first of all, we know, don't we, from all of Scripture, our good works are never enough to merit right standing with God. If you're an unbeliever here today, your good works, your good works are not sufficient to be right with God because God demands perfection. And there's only one person who lived a perfect life, and that's Jesus Christ, who always pleased God. And He went to the cross. This is taught many places in Revelation. He went to the cross to die for sinners and to absorb the punishment we deserve. 
so that if we put our faith and trust in Him, not in our own works, we're saved. That's the gospel, isn't it? If we repent of our sins and turn to Him, we're saved. That's absolutely fundamental. So if you're an unbeliever here, do not think that this passage is saying that you can be right with God on the basis of your works. But, but, we want to be fair to this passage too, don't we? The only righteousness that saves is Christ. But works are necessary. That's what this passage says. I didn't make that up. People are judged according to their works. Not on the basis of their works, but according to their works. And that, that, that's taught many places in the New Testament. It's not just in this one passage. We see it many, many places. Why is that? Why are we judged according to our works? Because works show the reality of our faith. Works, our works, though imperfect, show that our faith isn't mythical. Some Christians discount works entirely. They never want to talk about them in terms of the last judgment. Well, that's just not biblical. It doesn't fit with a passage like this and many other passages. No, the New Testament speaks of the necessity of works many times, but works as an evidence of our faith, as imperfect as they are. These works are a fruit of faith. They're a consequence of trusting in Christ. It's like, it's like uh, the sap of a tree that produces maple syrup, right? The, the maple syrup is the, is, is, our, is the work, and the sap is the faith. But you don't know the sap is there unless you get the syrup. The syrup shows the sap is, is, is flowing. That's what the New Testament teaches again and again. Because we can deceive ourselves about whether we really have faith. Now, the works aren't perfect, but they're there. There's a change in our lives. So, I close by saying this. Is there evidence in your life that you're a believer? Not as a basis, but is there evidence? Are you desiring to please Christ? Do you have a desire to tell others about Christ, share the gospel? Is that a desire in your heart? That's one sign you're a believer, isn't it? We're not perfect as Christians, but do you have that desire to tell others about the gospel? Children, no matter how young you are, do you have, do you have a desire to obey your parents? Not that you always fulfill it, but do you have a desire to do that? Do you have a desire to serve others in the body? Or when you really look at your life, do you live for mo movies and music and sports and entertainment? And that's just what drives you. It's driving you right now. You can't wait to get out of here. Or do you live to serve others? Husbands, do you sacrificially love your wives and care for them and nurture them? Wives, are you following the leadership of your husband? And all of us, is there any sin ruling over us? He breaks the power of canceled sin and he sets the prisoner free through his blood. That's what he does. He changes us. There is a new world coming. There's a final judgment coming. How I pray that everyone in here is included in the book of life, written in the book of life on that final day. Nothing's more important than that. Let's pray that God would give us such faith and trust. Let's pray that we would cling to Christ.